Hi, everyone. Good morning and welcome. It is 7 a.m. in Japan, nice and early morning, but it is 6 p.m. on the East Coast of America. And we are very excited to have once again Douglas Brooks joining us. Thank you so much, Douglas. Thank you. It's great to be here. Now, we talked, I think, two years ago, right? One year ago. One year ago. Okay, but so much has happened even since one year ago. And、uh, we've got lots of things to talk about. Now, Douglas is a boat builder, an educator, an author. You are documenting Japanese boat building, teaching it to students. You are doing so much. And you might be coming to Japan in January for a very exciting workshop. Let's mention that in the beginning and the end. Tell us about this barrel making workshop you're trying to raise money for. Yeah, so、uh, there, there's a really, really interesting response in Japan to the loss of craftspeople. And a group of young, young, younger Japanese barrel makers has teamed up with a famous soy sauce company on Shoto Island in the Inland Sea.、Uh, and they gather there every year and collectively, they just, it's open invitation to people to join and、uh, help. Build barrels, eight foot tall soy sauce barrels, and in the process, get introduced to barrel making and learn more about it and, and you know, maybe become、uh, proficient at it. So,、um, I'm why would I, a boat builder, be interested in this? It's because of the tub boats.、Um, the very first apprenticeship I did in Japan in 1996 was with the last builder of. What are called tub boats that are found only on Sato Island. And for those younger viewers interested in anime,、uh, they'll recognize that boat from the famous、uh, animated film Spirited Away. But those iconic little boats、uh, were kind of my introduction to Japanese boat building, which is really Japanese barrel making. And my first book documented how those boats are built. And so Through the publication of that book, I've become quite well known among Japan's remaining barrel makers.、Um, so, hence,、uh, and I still remain very, very interested in that craft. So, I'm looking forward.、Um, the organizers invited me to the summit.、Um, and yeah, I'm trying to raise funding to continue、uh, doing some research on that subject of barrel making, coopering in Japan. And,、uh, Yeah, I, I hope to be there in January to, to meet with those folks. That's fantastic. And since I talked to you last time, I have been to two places that you are very connected to. So, first, I was showing photos from Sado Island. Now, this was your first experience coming and doing boat making in Japan, like you said. I、yeah. visited these tub boats, I saw them in action、um, with fishermen、um, out looking through. Uh, like you see here, looking through to see what they wanted to catch、uh, different kinds of seaweed or seafood, and then sending their, their spears down.、Um, but the reason the tub boats are so popular in this area is because it's too shallow for regular boats, right?、Uh, yeah, it's not so much the, the depth of the water, it's.、Um... It's really, it's really kind of interesting. Back in the late 1800s, a massive earthquake uplifted the sea floor on that end of Sato Island. And if you go, that's the southeastern corner of the island, the Ogi Peninsula. And if you go there, what you see is this incredibly sharp volcanic rock coastline. And you can't, it, it's too dangerous. That's a good shot of it. Hold that shot. And、uh, despite, I mean, the quiet weather there, in any kind of rough weather, you can't bring a conventional boat into that shoreline. It's just too dangerous and treacherous. And so the story goes that some enterprising fishermen cut a barrel in half at, to make a boat. And、um, since about the late 1800s, the tub boat has been,、um, been used in that. That part of Sato Island. And they were actually used along the mainland coast、um, and the Noto Peninsula as well. And final thing is on Sato, they were traditionally used by women.、Um, now, the one photo you showed that showed a cutout 
in the bottom of the boat, like a glass bottom in the boat. That was an invention of my teacher, and that's a tourist boat. And those boats are, are larger than the fishing boats. And my teacher was quite proud of having invented the glass bottom tub boat. Um, the waters are crystal clear. And so the tourist company, uh, you know, the tourists when they're in them are, you know, mesmerized looking down through the, down through the uh, glass bottom in the center of the boat. But that is not a traditional setup for fishing. Yeah. Uh, that was great to see when I, I went to the Sado Island uh, big music festival last summer. Oh yeah, okay. And so yeah. I was Earth I was Earth. able to go in and do some sightseeing as well as see that awesome music festival. So many beautiful like taiko drumming and beautiful yeah. dance performances and things. Um, one thing you said about the the earthquake bringing up the coastline. Unfortunately, when I talked to people in the Noto Peninsula who had that horrible earthquake in January this year. Right. The right. same thing happened. The exact same thing right? happened. Yes. Yes. I in some places the sea floor was lifted over 20 feet. Okay. In fact, there's a there's a beautiful little fishing village that I visited back in 2003. It was full of wooden boats and in 2019 I returned to that village for the first time. And it was still full of wooden boats. I spent two days there with uh, an apprentice and we were measuring boats and talking to the fishermen and amazing. And a contact of mine in, um, in Kanazawa uh, sent me a, a photo, a Google Earth photo, and that entire harbor is above water. It just, the whole village was lifted up and the harbor no longer no longer fills with water at high tide. So just uh, amazing physical transformation there. And then such a great story of resilience to have the changing to the boat that would work with, right, with, right. The, new, with the new geography. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But another place, of course, the place that you want to go and, and join this amazing workshop, I went to Yamaroku, which is mm. the show you maker where he has been so excited and passionate about bringing back wooden barrel making so that he can make very high quality show you soy sauce. Mm. And yeah. uh, it was so great talking with him and of course mentioning um, that I had connected with you and he was really excited to connect with you and hopefully you can go for the workshop in January. Here we are stood inside one of these amazing barrels. They're yeah. really big. <laughs> yeah, they're really, they're not the biggest barrel in Japan. The biggest barrels are miso barrels. Okay. And um, my, my tub boat teacher on Sato Island, he was actually a third generation barrel maker. His grandfather, his father, and, and he had built uh, miso barrels. And those eight foot tall soy sauce barrels, you could easily put four of those in a miso barrel. Those are incredible. That's Just incredible. Monumental barrel making. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. So here we are. You can see we're totally yeah. stood up straight. And yeah. you say four of these inside yeah, a miso easily. barrel? Easily four of those could fit in a miso barrel. That yeah. is crazy. Yeah. Um, but you can see like how really well made, beautifully made. And then he was talking about um, it's really tricky. Of course, in your book, you document how to do the bamboo uh, tie around. The bamboo and how hoops. Difficult bamboo hoops and he yeah. was saying you don't want to make it too tight because the wooden barrel will expand over time and you can see all this bacteria in the whole show show you factory and they keep that that's what makes it delicious so right. i just learned so many things beautiful yeah 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 there's um some, some some manufacturers will tell you um you know it may have been at Yamaroku, because I did visit there in 2017, that the timbers that that built the storage building, they are convinced, and that storage building is 150 years old or something, they're convinced those timbers are far older, and it's because they were considered precious because they would have been impregnated with those spores. 
So in other words, 150 years ago, when they built that building, they were smart enough to realize these old timbers from an even older soy sauce factory are what we want to use, you know, to essentially seed this building with the right organisms. That's so, amazing. Yeah, it, it really is amazing. Yeah. And then it reminded me when I was looking at these big vats of soy sauce, yeah. they have to keep them watertight, of course, otherwise all the soy sauce would go out. But he said, as the soy sauce is fermenting, it actually seals the barrel so it doesn't seep out. And that happens naturally. Um, yeah. In a wooden boat, you would use some kind of sealant or how would you keep it from leaking? No, the tub boats, the, well, in the case of the tub boats, uh, it is strictly a wood to wood fit there. There are some techniques, um, but you are essentially building a, a barrel with a watertight fit throughout. And the wood does set, swell. The Japanese cedar swells. So if a tub boat leaked at launch a little bit, um, as long as the, the craftsmanship were, you know, to the right toler tolerances, um, it would swell tight and it wouldn't leak any longer. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Um, you said the, the bamboo wrap, the bamboo hoop was one of the trickiest things to that learn. That is the trickiest part of building those boats. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, that, and that you book, were not, you were not taught it, right? That's something we talked about last time. And something you try to then teach to your students is that the teachers or the craftspeople in Japan, they do not teach, they do not tell. Right. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, right. And so the short, the short answer is, so first of all, um, a little bit more background about me. I have since 1996 studied with nine boat builders from throughout Japan. And so what I do is I, I work and I'm the sole apprentice for seven of my nine teachers. And so what I do in my work, my, my hands-on research is I work alongside a boat builder we build a boat together and I record everything. So I record all the secret dimensions and ratios, um, the techniques and so on. And I write that all down and drawings and photographs and video as well to supplement that because uh, most Japanese boat builders uh, leave no written record whatsoever of their work. So in the case of seven of my teachers that never taught a successor. I mean, when they're gone, everything they know is lost. Um, and so that has informed my research work in Japan for the last 30 years. Um, so, and uh, it was a bit of a shock to me in my first apprenticeship and in all my subsequent apprenticeships that my teacher looked at me on the first day and said, there will be no speaking. You are not to talk to me. And so that begs the question, well, how am I going to learn? You know, isn't learning this, this, this verbal exchange? And in Japan, it isn't. And, and in Japan, the apprentice is expected to learn solely through observation. And, you know, that uh, the first thing we can say about that is it's not efficient. But that, that's, that's not a concern in Japan, at least not traditionally. What was more important was that that apprentice was really put under a tremendous amount of pressure and the pressure to learn only by observing uh first and foremost um honed their powers of observation right and um and this gets taken even further uh when in many cases the master would not teach the essential secrets of the craft to their apprentices and there's a well-known phrase in japanese nusumi geko which means stolen lessons and that is where the the apprentice would be forced to steal their their master's deepest secrets um, that would not happen if your master was a family member or your father or your uncle or so on and but, we uh, talked about that last time teachers, last time how you you had to be like a spy and Correct. go yeah. after right. hours and and look at his notes and document and things. Um, but you've also had uh, teachers who kind of realized that without you documenting, all of right. their knowledge was not going to be passed on. So you've you've been they're grateful now, right? Whereas yes. you were a bit worried about that dynamic, right? 
Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, a lot of people hear me lecture and they, they, what's one of the common questions is, well, why did these, why did these elderly craftspeople take you on? And the answer I'm convinced is in some sense, the timing for me was perfect. My teachers were all in their seventies and eighties when I worked with them. And I think they'd reached a point where they realized what was about to be lost. And I, I was kind of their last hope. Uh, you know, my some of my one of my teachers was a fourth generation boat builder. I mean, all these people were intensely proud of what they knew. And um, yeah, had I come along 10 or 20 years earlier, I don't know that I would have gotten the same reception. And in fact, right near you, I met a boat builder who was in his 80s when I met him. This was in 2018. And I remember we were having a really great conversation. I was asking him all kinds of questions about his work and his designs and his techniques. And suddenly in the middle of the conversation, he looked at me and it was like he slapped me in the face. He said, you know, if you'd walked in here 10 years ago, I would have thrown you out. And I, I, was, I was just stunned and I didn't say a word. And after a long pause, he looked at me and said, now somebody needs to document me. And it was amazing, absolutely amazing. Wow! Um, what an yeah, he's down, experience. He's down, yeah, you know, Yamaguchi, just on yeah. the Yamaguchi Hiroshima border. Yeah. And then you, last time we talked, you also said um, your first experience talking to a boat builder. You had the intention of interviewing of just right. documenting that way. And then you realize right. there's no way I can do it this way. I have to be an apprentice to really right. take it on. Right. right. Yeah. That whole. So again, uh, from the West, you, you have to remember that's our prejudice, how we view education. That is our prejudice. That does not necessarily translate culturally into another culture like Japan. And so, yeah, I, you know, I was with the notebook and the, the recording device and asking questions and and you know the first person i it was on sato island my eventual uh first teacher you know he would just every time i asked a question he would s jump up we were in his living room he would just jump up and say i'll show you and we would go out to the workshop and he would just dem he would just work completely silently and demonstrate and when he was done he would look up at me and say did you get that so, you know, he had, he had no language to teach in, in the way that we're used to learning. So, you know, as I sell, as I tell my college students, cause I've developed a college course based on these experiences and this pedagogy, I say in Japan, the teacher does not, the teacher refuses to teach, but the student is required to learn. And, and, you know, and I think there's a lot to be drawn from that style of teaching and learning, uh, largely because of the pressure it puts on the apprentice. You know, it, it's, it's, it taught me in, in reflecting on my own learning, whether it be high school, college, post-college, you know, craft in America, um, really how passive it is. We just sort of wait and we receive the information. And in Japan, it's it's completely different. It's in some ways the opposite. It's this person is working in front of me and, and I have to figure it out. So it's it's very intense. And, it's, and, I, it's and I think the learning that comes out of it is actually more embedded in the student because of it, because of that pressure. Yeah. So, yeah. And it's that, it's that concept of time too right yeah. like you you say you can build a boat with your students as a part of their course you can do it in two to four weeks but being an apprentice in japan they would expect you to give at least five to ten years to even right. be allowed to learn the craft right 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 yeah yeah the typical boat building apprenticeship in japan was six years and you know and i would always ask my teachers about that we would only talk at lunchtime <laughs> um and uh no chatting in the workshop um and they would typically say it would take as much as one or two years before they were even allowed to touch a tool they'd be sweeping and that's how i was treated i mean it it was a very accelerated kind of situation but in all nine of my apprenticeships the first thing that happened i was handed a broom 
you know, and, and I would sweep for a matter of days or weeks or whatever. I was always the person cleaning um, before I was brought in. But the difference between my situation an apprentice was coming in at 14 years old, not knowing anything. I was coming in as a mature craftsperson. I knew how to use the tools. And of course, as I did more of this in Japan, I was even, you know, sort of more skilled in Japan, the techniques of Japanese boat building. And so my, and my teachers understood I was there with them for the time it took us to build one boat together. And, and so in the tub boat, the case of the tub boat, that was two weeks. And then in the case at the other end, in the case of my Tokyo teacher, that was seven months. So that, that's, that, those were my apprentice in most cases, two to three months of, of work to build a boat. And so, you, you said you've done it nine times around nine Japan, times, yeah. right? And here's the map of all the locations you've covered almost everywhere. Uh, before we started, you mentioned that boat building in Okinawa is really exciting. Have you yeah. had a chance yet to go to Okinawa and be yeah, a that, part of Yeah, that was my, in 2009 I apprenticed with one of only three, at that time, one of only three elderly boat builders left in all of Okinawa. And, but Okinawa has seen a real revival. The boat is called the Sabani. It's actually what's all over my shirt. If you can see my shirt, uh, I got this shirt in Okinawa. Um, and Sabani were the traditional wooden fishing boats of uh, that archipelago. And in the early nineties, um, young people, yachtsmen, uh, windsurfers, surfers, and others, kayakers, just kind of got interested in this local boat and they began to race them. And they're notoriously difficult to sail. And so people were challenged by that. And it's, it has coalesced into an amazing movement. And now there are probably 40 to 45 Sabani teams throughout Okinawa and they race throughout the summer, mainly the summer season. Um, and that's not a Sabani from Okinawa. That, that isn't either. But if you, if you get to one, I'll, I'll yell out. These are boats from my apprenticeships to the, to the viewers. Um, oh boy. Well, anyway, uh, I don't think I have my, one. Sorry. Yeah, I'll Just search it. My website yeah. and look at the Sabani, S-A-B-A-N-I. Okay. And and you'll you'll see images of them. But anyway, the, it's an incredible movement. And now young people, actually, at the time I was apprenticing with one of these last craftsmen, a Japanese woman was apprenticing with one of the other Japanese craftsmen. She is now a professional boat builder in Okinawa, building Sabani. Um, she's Japan's only woman boat builder. As far as I know, I'm probably pretty, that's probably a pretty certain thing. And there we go. That's the page from my website on the Sabani. And, uh, so anyway, yeah, the, it's a great, um, it's a great craft revival, um, in Japan. So I'd love to see that replicated elsewhere in the country. Yeah, that's a good shot. So. Yeah, beautiful pictures here on your website. Uh, you. And I'll put the link below so people can find it themselves. Um, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, so nine apprenticeships around. Now you're coming back, hopefully, to do wooden barrel making. Um, but you also, you're involved with uh, other projects around the world as well as teaching in America. Uh, you did a festival in France. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I was um, I was invited to a festival in the city of Set S E T E, which is on the Mediterranean. It's midway between Marseille and Montpellier, and there is a huge maritime festival there every spring. Um, and yeah, that's great. That's great. You had that shot. And so I um, I have developed a seven day Japanese boat building workshop where I take about eight to 10 students and we build a 22 foot traditional river boat from Niigata prefecture on the, Shim on the Shinano river. Uh, and I've been teaching that in craft schools. Um, I taught that twice in Australia and now France. I've taught it all, all across the U S 
Um, so the festival organizers had arranged for um, eight, yeah, I think we had eight young people in set to work with me, um, which was really kind of interesting. Uh, I studied French in high school uh, 40 years ago and uh, over 40 years ago and have never used my high school French. So we kind of had that 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 no language, no talking um, situation ready made for us, um, uh, though my my French surprisingly uh, came back a good deal, which which was nice. So anyway, yeah, over the course of the festival, we built this boat together. We had a beautiful launching ceremony. There were several hundred people there uh, for the launching. And and to my surprise, you know, why did this festival in France want Japanese boat building? It turned out that there was a relationship between actually Hiroshima, the Hiroshima region and this uh, French city. Uh, and so there was a whole delegation from Japan there as well. So um, the organizers, I, I found this out all after the fact, having brought these Japanese over, um, they kind of said, gee, what about Japanese boat building? We're showcasing Mediterranean boat building from, you know, from, uh, uh, from Venice and Spain and France and elsewhere. Um, what about Japanese boat building? And they, they found me. So it was great. It was great fun. It was it was really amazing. How how does your Japanese compare to your French? Oh, my Japanese is far better than my French. Actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in 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 studying Japanese, um, I went through that period early on where, whenever I couldn't think of a Japanese word, I would insert a French word. I don't know how many conversations early on in Japan I would insert avec and maintenant into my Japanese conversation. And when I started trying to speak French, I did the, it was flipped. I was doing the opposite and I kept throwing in Japanese words. So anyway, oh, that's the joys funny. Of, of learning a foreign language. I love that Hiroshima connection you keep finding. Um, because originally your roommate who was from Hiroshima was the one that gave you the ticket to right. first come to Japan saying, okay, now no excuses, right. come on over, right? Right, that was in 1990, my first trip, yeah. yeah. That's and in Europe, um, I'm currently working with a Spanish boat building school, actually a school in the Basque region uh, near San Sebastian. And they would like to bring me over for several months to teach Japanese boat building. In fact, the director of the school fell in love with the Okinawan Sabani. That's the boat he'd like me to teach. So he, he's in the process of trying to raise funding for that. Um, it's an amazing school and a two year boat building curriculum. And I really, really hope that comes to pass. That would be really something. So, That's really exciting. Yeah, that would be very exciting. Yeah. Now, one of the things we talked about uh, before we started was how uh, when I talk to artisans or people trying to perpetuate traditional craft in Japan, they always lament that there are no training schools here. Right. And that people are surprised, you said, when you mentioned how much is happening to preserve traditional right. practices in other countries. Can you talk right. about that just a little bit? Yeah, so again, again, it's our Western point of view versus Japanese point of view. The idea of a, the idea of a craft school is a very modern idea in Japan. Um, I like to tell people, I live in the tiny state of Vermont, USA, and there are more woodworking schools in the state of Vermont than I think in all of Japan. You know, standalone woodworking schools, not talking shop classes in, in the public schools or anything like that. Um, you know, I think Takumi Juku in, in Takayama is, I think, the first woodworking school in Japan. And I don't know, Takumi Juku is only maybe 30 years old. I should, I should look that, but I, I think I'm about right. The, it's starting to happen. There, there's a brand new woodworking school opening in Kawaguchiko on the slopes of Mount Fuji uh, by a friend of mine. Um, so this is slowly starting to happen. This barrel making summit, this, it's not a formal school, but this is completely outside of the apprentice tradition. OK, so it is in itself, you know, in, and that's why I, I can't wait to get there. And, and I really want to witness this. I'm sort of anticipating kind of a, 
a hybrid Japanese Western idea of teaching the craft. But as I like to tell people outside of Japan, you know, pick a craft, uh, whatever it might be. Um, if you were to go to Japan and say, I want to learn how to make shoji screens. And Joy, you've you've lived most of your adult life in Japan. You tell me if I'm I'm out of my mind when I say this. I contend that if you asked a hundred Japanese people, I want to learn how to make shoji screens, 99 of them would say, you have to find a master. And that 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 is how crafts have always been transmitted in Japan. And that's a hard that's just a hard thing to change so that's absolutely true and that's something uh we were talking with john stolenmeyer and brett rasmussen who are rebuilding old houses or building new houses and in japanese traditional carpentry and they say it's such narrow margins for them and to take on an apprentice uh you want them to continue with you to give value later once they learn what they're doing um, right. But that's where workshop schools like this could really b give a wider approach to more people, right? Right. To give them just a taste of it, and then maybe they want to be apprentice or devote their lives to it, right? Right. The oldest craft school I've ever heard of in Japan is in Beppu. It's the it's the school of bamboo basketry. And that was formed in 1949. Now, you, you know, if you're in Europe or America or North America, I mean, think of, you know, craft schools that have been around for a hundred or more years. You know, I mean, the idea, the idea of vocational education, you know, craft education in a, in a large institution has existed in America since the late 1800s. Right. And so here you have in Japan, you know, the oldest school I have ever come across, 1949. So and a great school, by the way. So wow, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And I think Alex Kerr, who has written so many books about uh, pre preserving the traditional houses, using right. old houses, renovating them into guest houses, like the appeal, not only for international people, but the appeal for Japanese people. Once right. you bring these traditional cultural aspects back where you yeah. can actually use it in comfort right yeah so yeah i remember so much potential back in 2007 i was invited by a japanese boat builder who actually builds western boats western style boats on lake biwa he invited me to come and teach a workshop a lofting workshop which is a western boat building technique and i you know i remember he and he said i've got a full class i've got seven people here so so i i did it i came to Japan and I taught this lofting class. And I remember thinking, wow, why, you know, why are, why are these seven Japanese people, why are they taking a lofting class? So I asked them and they were all, they were all amateur boat builders. They wanted to build their first boat and they were all planning on building Western boats. And I thought, what, why is that? Why? I mean, Japan is so full of amazing, you know, wooden boats. And they looked at me and said, well, but the only, the only boats I can find plans, books, you know, et cetera, et cetera, are Western boats. And I realized they were right. They were right. There were no resources for them to build their native boats. Yeah. So anyway, that's kind of informs my work. Ah, you're showing the boat from Lake Biwa. That's a... That's a very odd boat. <laughs> it's it's a beautiful project. Yeah, uh, it, yes. Was this last really, year, it, the boats of Lake Biwa are absolutely unique in Japan. If you can see closely, you'll see that the bow of that boat is planked. Uh, well, you can't see it in that view. The underside view is better. Go back. Go back. Yeah. If you can see it in that image, um, the bow of that boat is is planked like a barrel. And that's only found on Lake Biwa. And uh, I was asked by the owner of a ryokan uh, on Lake Biwa to build a replica of, of a traditional Lake Biwa boat. And it was, it was interesting. I, w I went in with some trepidation because I'd never done it before. Um, but by the time I was done, I was, I was kind of a fan <laughs> of that method. 
anyway that's a that is a really unique japanese boat yeah yeah interesting now one of your big projects which you are just yeah. allowed to talk about is that your boat that you built with your students was used in a very popular show um as well as you were used as an expert advisor tell us about this how did this happen yeah so in 20 2020 end of 2020 it was right in the middle of covid and all my teaching had evaporated i was in my shop just building a boat on speculation trying to you know generate some income um i was contacted by representatives of disney corporation and uh and that that led to uh they hired me to be the japanese boat consultant for the 10-part series shogun which just debuted uh late late this last spring and so in the course of that i was providing designs to the movie makers um and set builders ultimately built the boats but at one point um they were so desperate you know to get as many boats as they could they though yeah hang on to show that they asked me are there any japan wooden japanese small boats anywhere in north america you know about that we could get for the production and i said well you could buy some of my college students boats and those two boats sitting upside down were built by my students at bates college in lewiston maine in 2019 uh part of the class i taught there and that that's the set that represents the the city of osaka that's just a portion of the set uh that figures prominently in the series so yeah so i brokered the sale of those boats to disney um and that's that's one of the set builders boats so then from there i i provided uh designs authentic designs that again that the set builders built that's a photo from the bates college launching we had in 2019 so uh anyway yeah it was it was uh there are the baits there are my students on launch day with those boats and that's the that's the river boat from the shinano river in Niigata. that's the 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 boat i most commonly teach i have some other designs i can teach but that's the that's the one i've taught the most that's beautiful and you gave some insights about how to row it how to move yeah the so boat, right? so the the Japanese sculling oar that, you know, as, as they were building the boats, as the set builders were, and the boats, by the way, the set builders, they built them out of quarter inch plywood. Then they were grain painted, you know, so they looked, they looked, they looked great from a little ways off and they worked perfectly in, in the series. Um, but uh, if you've watched the series, you know, all those boats are propelled by the Japanese sculling oar uh and so kind of late in my involvement in shogun actually it was just a couple of months before shooting started i i was talking to my contacts there and i said well what about what about who's gonna you know who's gonna teach your extras how to scull these boats i mean because i i know how to do that and i know that it's you know it's tricky it takes some skill and a lot of practice and the original oh boy i guess i can say this i signed all kinds of non-disclosure agreements but um, the series is aired now, so what the heck? Um, there to the um, there on the right is a boat that would have had would, that has six oarsmen or people oarsmen. Um, so you get an idea of uh, it's a pretty complex action. But anyway, um, they told me that Disney's original concept was to tow the boats on an underwater wire while the extras swung an oar back and forth that was cut off at the surface of the water and so they were going to attempt this grand effort to fake this and i as somebody who also loves to use boats and uh and knows how to use the sculling oar i was pretty horrified and so I talked my way onto the set. I talked them into flying me out to Vancouver to the set. And I said, give me one week. And they did. And um, I had the 30 extras and eight hours a day. I was in a little rubber Zodiac 
chasing the <laughs> chasing the boats. And I've got to say, these extras who you know were just hired from the Vancouver area, they were great. They they worked hard. They were serious. They paid attention. They didn't get frustrated. And by the end of the week, by the time I said goodbye, I said, okay, you know, you've got three or four weeks before fil filming starts every day. Come here to the set, get in the boats and go. And they were great. They were great. I watched the series myself and they were doing it. And I really, really, I wasn't paying attention to the, 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 the series, really the, the plot at all. I was just looking for the boats, but they did it. And I, I re really felt great to see that. So. Wow, that's awesome. Well, Douglas, you have the full package. You can make the boats. You can teach them how to use the boats. <laughs> yeah, well, I've done a lot of, yeah, I've done a lot of sculling of boats in Japan, so. Wow, that's great. Um, that was really exciting. What an exciting project. And the fact you can talk about it now is really fun. Yeah, and I'll just say to the audience, you know, if if anything we've talked about here, you're you're flummoxed by, or you'd like to know more about, like the sculling ore, for instance, send me an email from my website. Send me an email, and um, I can send you an article I wrote about the Japanese sculling ore, and you can learn more about it. Yeah, and that's actually that's actually another research project. There, as far as I know, there is only one professional ore maker left in japan and he's he's near you he's in um he's in onomichi oh and uh or is that that's mukaishima right off mukaishima? Onomichi? that's right opposite mukaishima. Onomichi. Yeah. yeah he's a wonderful man but he's elderly now um and i am i'm uh, my next grant application is going to be to try to get a grant to come and work with him i've met him several times He's he's actually last time I saw him in December, he looked at me and he said, I need an apprentice. Oh. I need an apprentice. He's another elderly craftsperson who realizes what's going to be lost when he's gone. And he has an amazing workshop. Um, and I'd like to get over there for a period of a couple of weeks and just work with him and document his work. So. Oh, that would be great. It would, um, uh, and it's so. It's it's just this is one of these moments that it's 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 great and it's frightening. Yes, you know how much longer is he going to be able to do this? Well, exactly uh, because you talked about your first master that you learned from and how quickly he died after he. he I I never you. saw him again after my apprenticeship. He died in an accident, sadly. So we and need to get yeah, on. I, it. I was there. I got there at the the last minute. Really. Yeah, it's very yeah. fortuitous. Yeah, we need to start documenting like you've been doing. It's such a pres preserving this heritage and culture for future generations is so important. Really yeah. appreciate all the work that you're doing. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. And it's so near me. Now I feel like I want to go over and see yeah. him. So please let me know later. Maybe at least I can go talk to him and take some photos before you can get there. But I would love to go when you're there and yeah. document what you're doing because you you are the you understand it on a actual tactile uh teacher and apprentice level that i i could never do so well i invite you to go there without me because i think i i think it means a lot for i feel in my own experiences that it means so much to these elderly craftspeople that somebody cares yes you know that somebody is willing to look into their dusty old shop and say wow this is amazing you know can i and he's a wonderful he's also a wonderful approachable person so yeah absolutely go take photos spend a spend a day with him watching him or something yeah i'll give you i'll get you that information awesome awesome i will definitely do that um now one other project you were sharing on your instagram is is how you rebuilt a derelict boat now your story reminded me so much of uh there's a great story matt alt tells uh in his innovation and invention japan book where he talks about a guy who was making japanese toys after the war uh, mm -hmm. he took a bath towel and he measured out uh american jeep and then went back and made a tiny but accurate scale toy mm -hmm. of what he'd seen. 
Hmm. Um, so remaking something uh, in a different way, but to preserve it is, is such a cool way to do it. How did this project come about? Now you got to, are you oh, referring sorry. to the, the, the Kumagawa? This one? Is this, this one? Let me uh, put my glasses on. Oh, sorry. Uh, you that. said. Oh, 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 well, no, I'm so I'm, well, I'm replicating a boat. Replicating. Okay. I'm replicating about. So yeah, I wish I, oh, I wish I had the photo of the derelict. That's pretty, pretty striking. That's buried in my blog. So I was approached um, this winter by uh, a man in Texas who um, for the last two years has had uh, a Japanese um, tea house carpenter at his property and has built him a pair of tea houses. And he's now having a Japanese garden built which includes a large pond and he approached me and I'm building this boat right now. Um, it's a traditional Japanese boat for his private Japanese garden. So, yeah. And so the boat, when we were going back and forth, he said, okay, I can't have a boat more than 16 feet long, but he wanted to have the maximum volume in the boat area in the boat. And there was a design that I found in uh, Chiba, I believe the city of Sawara, Sawara is in Chiba. It's, um, it's by Lake Kasumigarua, which is kind of south of Narita Airport, you know, to the southeast of Tokyo by a couple hours. And I found a derelict boat. It's called a Sapa Sen, a Sapa Bune. And Sapa means bamboo leaf. And they are a beautiful, to me, they're a beautiful, beautiful design. And I found this boat years ago and I measured it while I was there and just never forgot it and always wanted to build it. And truth be told, uh, when I was negotiating with this uh, client, I was I was so pushing this boat over any other boat because <laughs> I it's just it's a completely new design for me to build. And I'm I'm really enjoying it. It's great. Yeah, I love love. I love the design. So that's, that's the wonderful. story. Yeah. No, I mean, you were talking about Shodoshima before, wanting to go back there. Uh, that's in Kagawa, yep. uh, right? Kagawa has one of the most beautiful gardens I've ever seen. And I just went there recently and went around in one of these beautiful river river style pond boats, which is all wooden and with a guy yeah, who was punting us through. It's gorgeous. Yeah, and I built it. You built that? Yeah, they have two. I built uh -huh. the newer one. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I built that in 2017. Amazing. Didn't <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, in 2017, I was, I was, yeah, I was hired to, um, yeah, the, the contractor needed a boat builder. They got the contract for a new boat for the garden. And, and I had met them, I, I mean, just a brief meeting several years earlier and they, I was it. I was, they said, this is the guy. And so I went over in 2017. I hope you were on my boat. The older boat is now completely fiberglass on the outside. And my boat is just, is still wood, uh, just unfiberglass wood. So hopefully you're on my boat. I think the fates would have put you on my boat. I was definitely on an all wooden boat, okay. which was absolutely beautiful. I'm going to put the link to Ritzerine Garden here. Yeah. Um, but I should show the picture because I think it shows the boat here. Let's see. Okay. Yep. Is that the boat? Yeah. 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 That's the boat. That's my boat. <laughs> and then I have a page at my, I have a page at my uh, website on that boat too. Beautiful. Yeah. The two boats are identical. I copied the original boat and it's, it's, if you go to Ritz, Ritz is a gore, just an amazing garden. And if you go there, the boat ride, I really recommend it. Not to just stroke my ego. It's a really wonderful vantage point on the garden. You know, just, I mean, despite the fact you walk everywhere, it is so great to be in a boat on that pond in the garden. Would you say? Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And yeah. it doesn't, there's no engine. So all no. you hear is the quiet water of yeah. someone just punting through the water right next yeah. to you and yeah. telling you stories about how the garden was designed. And it's just, it's gorgeous. I would definitely yeah. recommend it. Good. Yeah, good. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> wow, how fun. Yeah. All right. We've talked about a lot of projects. Any Anything else you wanted to talk about? 
Yeah, well, briefly, you and I, when the, when we did this episode last year, you found me in Japan. Um, I was in, I was building a fleet of six traditional boats for the Kumagawa Kudari in Kyushu, and that's a downriver whitewater tour trip. And in uh, 2020, in the middle, actually, they approached me right before COVID, a new owner, they had six boats, they were all old, 25 to 35 years old. And the new owner said to me, I want you to build two new boats, and then we'll see how that goes. And, you know, maybe over the next several years, you'll build two at a time until I have a new fleet. And I said, great, COVID hits, the country shuts down, I can't come and work with him for him. And then in the summer of 2020, the biggest floods in recorded history come down the Kuma River and wipe out the whole fleet and wipe out all his shoreside facilities, everything. And the next message I get from him is, now I need six boats. And so that set in motion um, organizing the project, the materials, a workspace, a work visa, so I could enter the country during COVID. And in the fall, we're coming up on two years ago, this fall, I returned to Japan and st started building. And I built, uh, with an assistant, I built six 36-foot riverboats, exact replicas of the boats that he had. And those boats, because I got to kind of do some research on the history of those boats, um, those boats have been unchanged for over 100 years. So um, I'm actually just submitted an article about that project to an American magazine. So that's going to be published um, later this fall. Oh, that's uh, awesome. This, the that's story of building hear. those boats. Yeah. yeah what an amazing that was a story. Huge, huge project. And I had great partners in Japan. I had great assistants. Um, and, you know, speaking earlier about the interest in boat building, I was Instagramming about that project. So if you go to my Instagram and go back to 2020, end of 2022 through 2023, you'll see photos and videos of the building of those boats. Um, in, just Instagramming on my Instagram, poor little me, I was receiving emails from all over the world and from all over Japan, from people saying, I want to come and see this. How do I come and volunteer with you? I want to learn Japanese boat building. And um, I had one person from overseas join me for a few days, uh, a young woman from Berlin. And I invited, I allowed several people from around Japan, as far away as Tokyo, came and would spend a few days and volunteer or watch or sweep, <laughs> uh, whatever. So, um, yeah, you know, it really proved to me that um, a, a major, if I could get another major boat building project like this, I'm, I, I absolutely want to create a training program around it because the interest is there. There is no question about that. People uh, we, want to study this. So absolutely, we have a comment so on YouTube right now from Ethan. Thanks so much for joining. Oh. Uh, he says, "I would love to take a class with you one day." I think okay. this is definitely there is a lot of interest. So even when you come over and you do these projects where you're building boats, is it in a place where people could just watch and kind of get hooked on on maybe being a part of? rebuilding boats or building boats in japan yeah well yes i mean like i built a boat at the seito uchi festival in 2014 that was a public demonstration and i've done some projects i've built several boats for museums in japan that have been public with hundreds and thousands of people coming by to watch um in when i built the river boats uh last year you know, I, the shop was open. I didn't turn anybody away and we had people drop in. I think I, I think every local woodworker in that area at one time or another stopped by and several of them, you know, helped out, which was great. So, um, and I also try very hard to include apprentices in my projects, both Japanese and non-Japanese. So, um, but I, you know, I haven't been in a situation yet where like it would be so great to have the, the, the time and some budget room 
to really like create that program and train people. That's what I really want to do. Um, so the next project that comes my way in Japan, I'm going to work very, very hard to make that happen. So find housing for visiting students, you know, um, uh, certainly make you know, get the word out that this is available and then, yeah, try to make it happen as a training program. And I, if I could do that, I would certainly also want to be, I need your help. I would want to publicize it. I would want in Japan for some light bulbs to go off and some people to think people in powerful places or people with running organizations to think, Hey, you know, maybe the time has come for a boat building school. You know, maybe, maybe my city or my museum or my university could sponsor something like this. So absolutely. We'll yeah. I mean, wherever we have castles with moats in Japan, wherever we have gardens with ponds in yeah. Japan, right. we should be having these beautiful traditional wooden boats. And what, what better way to publicize this asset for locals and visitors than to have wooden boat building? We're right. actually making it here kind of event, right? Yeah, well, you're right. And actually, um, Japan is always really surprised me the sheer number of traditional wooden boats in the tourist industry you know shrines have boats there are so many festivals that involve traditional boats like you say and there are like um hakone um hikone himeji castle now has one or two boats in the moat hiroshima castle has a boat one or two boats in the moat um so yeah i mean there 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 is such there are so many opportunities um, to create boats as tourist amenities. So, yeah, uh, yeah, you just have it's, to, you know, you have to provide the source for those boats. And absolutely. a boat building school, a boat building school in my kind of furthest fantasy could be teaching boat building and yeah. supplying those boats. Yes, absolutely. You know, in a cost effective way. I would love to see somebody watching this video get in touch with you and bring you over to do these two to four week programs in their destination to get locals trained and excited about bringing back this tradition. It's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe the prime minister is watching. The new one? We're, we're transitioning. <laughs> we, don't, well, we don't have <laughs> Oops. <laughs> we're, we're changing right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. But Kishida-san, the prime minister, he was from Hiroshima. So oh, really? we've had a lot oh, of connections to Hiroshima here today. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, boy. Well, next time you see him. Uh, yeah, he'll be he'll retired. Still, he'll, he's still bound to have some influence. He's got to, yeah. Next time you bump into him. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, we had the G7 here. So wouldn't it be great to have all yeah. the G7 leaders riding a traditional boat, you know, yeah. whenever we have these big events, right? You know, Joy, in 1990, how, when did you come to Hiroshima first? Uh, 96. In 1990, I went to, you know, I came to Japan for the first time and I went to visit my college roommate and his family in Hiroshima. There was a fleet of lovely wooden boats at the Peace Park. Really? And by the time, I'm trying to think of the next time I came, it was a while before I came back to Hiroshima and they were gone. Oh. They were gone. I want to I have research a that. I can, I can see in my mind's eyes, in my file folders upstairs, I have a 35 millimeter slide of that fleet and they were beautiful they were actually western boats but they were this lovely little rowboat they were all it's an all wooden fleet yeah yeah well, i would love i would love to see that come back and actually oh. hiroshima castle hiroshima right now the moat perfect we don't those have rivers. any boats but no, uh, those rivers we would are so beautiful the rivers yeah hiroshima rivers are perfect oh yeah and yeah. the castle moat. We need a nice, uh, beautiful wooden boat without a motor, please. <laughs> okay. Okay. Fair keep, enough. I, keep I'll the quiet, that. right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, oh, Douglas. It's been boy, great talking to you. you. Great. And I've got all the links below. So I will hopefully people will get in touch with you. We yeah. also want to help you fundraise so you can get over 
for the barrel making workshop in January. I hope you have many trips uh, to Japan coming up. We're so excited for what you do. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is great. Good. And thank you everybody for joining and watching. And I hope you enjoyed it and get excited about a wooden boats in Japan. Whenever you see a beautiful traditional Japanese wooden boat, wherever you are in Japan or elsewhere, uh, take get a in picture touch. and send it to me. Yeah, get in touch. I, we would love to Please. see it, right? Yeah. Please get in touch. Not with Joy, with me. First to me. <laughs> and then me. And then me. Tag me. We can tag both of us, right? Okay, great. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. See you next Thank time. Thank you. Arigato.